well it's good to be with you guys it's good to be alive in Jesus and uh, so we uh, we've been in Genesis 17 and uh, I want to reiterate some things tonight before we get into verse 2 of chapter 17 and that is to um, rehearse the uh, impart importance of the firstborn and I want to do that by looking at several other scriptures um, and so that we can we might see that in context of what I'd like to share uh, so my first one is and the, this first one I shared a long time ago <clears throat> it's in uh, 2 Kings chapter 3 if you'll turn there and I want us to look at um, an instance of the firstborn that that was still honored by God and it was still uh, it, it still had an effect and this is in 2nd Kings chapter 3 verse 24 and when they came to the camp of Israel the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them but they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country so Israel is defeating the Moabites and they beat down the cities and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kerahaseth left they the stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom. So, so the whole battle's going bad for Moab, and so the king decides to get uh, uh, 700 of his top men. And if he can break through to Edom, then he can get some help. And um, <clears throat> through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. Now, it doesn't actually tell you what, you know, it, it, uh, what turned this thing. Uh, it says there was great indignation against Israel, which on one hand you might have read this, that there was great indignation against Moab for doing this. Um, but this is, this was the king of Moab, not just offering his son, but offering him for a burnt offering, it says. And the result of that is, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. Now they were winning, the enemy was winning, the people were uh, uh, being destroyed, their camps, their cities, everything. I mean, they were, Israel was going through and just wiping it out. And in this instance, uh, a foreign king offers his firstborn for a burnt offering. He doesn't do it as a pagan because the, the Moabites, just so you know, had a lot of really bad pagan offerings. Um, but this was a burnt offering. And when, when they did, the tide was turned. The tide was turned in this situation. And uh, when I shared this before, I mentioned it in terms of that God honors that idea, that God honors that because that is what he's all about and what his son is going to be all about when he comes. And... Um, and that's what um, you see, you know, all the way back in, uh, um, in uh, Exodus, when we see the offering of the firstborn, we see that um, God took Egypt's firstborn, but his firstborn was not Israel's firstborn that survived because they had the blood. His firstborn was the lamb. His firstborn was the lamb. That was the one. And they put the lamb on the inside of them. 
And that's what made them a firstborn in, in, you know, in a spiritual sense. That's what made them a firstborn. And then what would truly make them a firstborn, and the whole point of the firstborn, is always that you can identify who has the lamb, who has the firstborn in them uh, in the Old Testament by the fact that they, they're given. They, their life is given. And, uh, and it's not just given randomly. It's not done in a chariot wreck. I was going to say car wreck. But, uh, but it was done by understanding and in a certain spirit that would glorify God. And that's the difference. I mean, that's that's the you know. I mean, that's the difference between compassionate ministry, and and the kind of ministry that Mary Bethany poured out upon Jesus in a certain spirit, in a certain spirit of loss, in the certain spirit of of selflessness, uh, in the spirit of it being not about her, but focused, focused on him, focused on Jesus. And so I want to give you another example and uh, maybe an example that you maybe not never saw in the light of the firstborn. And yet you see, Jesus is the firstborn. And so it'll always be about him. It'll always be that he is going to be the one that the father wants in any situation. He's not, you know, I'm sorry, folks. He's not just wanting Christians. He's not. He's wanting his firstborn son, and he's wanting him specifically in us. So anyway, if you will turn with me to Numbers chapter 21. Book of Numbers 21. <clears throat> and we're going to look at verse, we're going to start at verse 4. Verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul and the soul of the people and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Okay, well, this is the way God's taken them. Uh, you know, you, you have to realize that they had a... Uh, a cloud by day and a fire by night that was leading them through the wilderness and um, that if they're discouraged about the way the, you know no need talking about Moses or anybody else you know go talk to the fire <laughs> you know go argue with the fire you know go argue with the cloud when you're in this hot wilderness and he takes it away and then you think it's you think it's tough. There, at that point, there is no way you could choose that isn't going to be worse than what you're experiencing right now. And the fire by night to be able to see. So there, but it's not just that they're discouraged. It's their soul and the soul of the people. It's the soul of the people. It's, the, it's our very uh, mind, will, and emotion and our response to... Um, flesh and things that come upon our flesh and you know I don't like this and put me in a better situation and and this is this sadly that you know this may comprise most of our prayer life I mean it would be bad to stand before God and he really you know we really begin to see him as the slain lamb slaughtered lamb sitting on the throne for us that we could be there and then they go through a list of prayers that are all about my soul and my flesh. And this was uncomfortable. And I really, you know, so I prayed. And, you know, and what we thought might be spiritual at the time when we're doing it, maybe before God would look like, oh, my God, look at me. This is horrible. This is terrible. You know, I don't know that we, <laughs> I don't know that we think through those kind of things. But nonetheless... Um, and and uh, <clears throat> the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The soul was reacting to the body because the way is physical. It's a physical thing. 
But the soul is going, well, I don't like this. Okay, so discouraged, much discouraged, not just kind of discouraged, much discouraged. And verse 5, And the people spake unto God and against Moses. And the people spake, un, uh, uh, spake sorry, against God and unto Moses. The people sp spoke against God. Now, I can understand Moses, you know. Maybe you don't like guys with long hair and beards. I don't know. But <laughs> I can see someone speaking against some leader, you know. Uh, we do it all the time. I'm not just talking about in church. I'm talking about, you know, well, we speak against our president. We speak against this or that or all, all of these things. And, um, uh, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us out, uh, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Okay, well, really, I don't know that any of them had died yet. Seriously. I mean, think about it. The deaths started when they got to the land of promise and wouldn't go in, you know. And then God said, that's it, you know. But if you think about it, I mean, we don't really have any recorded deaths before that time because um, it was, the scripture says it was an 11-day journey from where they were in Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, which is the doorway to the promised land. 11 day journey and it's at that point when they murmured i mean if you're murmuring about out here you should be happy about entering into some great things that god has but they they um they it was at that point that god said okay you're going to drop in the wilderness and this trip's going to become 40 years long so so if it was genuine and genuinely an 11 day journey to get to Kadesh Barnea, then probably nobody died yet. So, you know, they're going discouraged because of the way and the people spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die? Well, you did died in Egypt too. Remember they were beating you and you know, you remember any of that stuff? No, I don't. I, I don't feel that. I don't feel the lashes of the Egyptians. Well, what if God could say, well, I'll just teleport you back over there. And, you know, then you won't speak against God because he won't be with you. Remember, he came down. So, I mean, it's just funny how we don't think about these things. We, we really don't. We don't. You know, it's like, well, this situation is really bad. Well, where do you think you'd ended up on the other situation? You know, I mean, that's that's sad that we can't remember past, you know, our, our, our latest thing that we don't like. We can't remember past that, you know, and it is, we can't evaluate and weigh and say, is this is this better than that? You know, and they go, you know what? This is better than Pharaoh and them, you know. But they remembered the leeks and the garlic and the stuff, and they said, we want to go back to Egypt at a certain juncture. He's going, all right. So, for there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, which is the manna, which was manna from heaven. And, and Jesus is talking to him, and they said, well, he gave us bread you know, do like what Moses did. He gave us bread from heaven. Do like Moses. If you were with those guys back then, you'd be griping about the bread. Now you're going, oh, yeah. You're probably working jobs, getting, you've got bread and stuff, but you, you just want free bread now. See, and before it's no bread, now it's, Praise God, I have a job and I'm living here in Nazareth or where, wherever. It's not the best situation, but I have bread. But now I want free bread. You know, you can't satisfy the soul. You can't satisfy the flesh. The flesh is always going to um, 
kick against the goads. It's always going to be dissatisfied. All right. So, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Now they're dying. See, did you bring us out here to die? Yes. I, you're going to be you the way that you are right now. Poof, serpents, sick them. I mean, it, that is what happened. That it, there were, we have no recorded deaths until now. That is what took place. And God said, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with you dying in the wilderness. You'll die by the serpents when Korah and his group start throwing a fit because they want to be leaders. They'll die by the earth opening up and taking them straight to hell and, you know, no, no uh, unpearly gates that you'll pass through down there. You'll just go straight in. <laughs> um, you know, these stories, I mean, if they're real, then we see we're, we're getting a, a picture of us. We're getting a picture of our flesh. We're getting a picture of what, what's lacking um, of a heart for the Lord, of clear focus, you know, uh, clear uh, heart following Him and being uh, in the flow of what is His heart and His way and His mind and His uh, flow with the, the people that are going to flow with Him. Just kind of outside the camp, you know, and there's, there's always people outside the camp that come in and get and whatever, but... Um, so, um, so, and the Lord sent fiery, fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, okay? So, you're spewing poison, you're going to reap what you sow. No, 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 I won't reap what I sow. I can do this without any, you know, any backlash from God. I can be this way, I can... I can, instead of being fully in the river and flowing, I can sit on the bank and throw rocks, you know, that sort of thing. Well, for how long? I mean, that's the question. Um, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel, it signifies that, it didn't say just much people died, much people of Israel died. They died. They died. Okay. Did you bring us out here to die? No, that wasn't my original intention. intention. My original intention was to bring you to me, was to bring you closer to me, was to bring you to a place where you could hear my voice, where I, you, I didn't have to yell or I didn't have to shake the world or send serpents you could get close enough where if I spoke with the, thus saith the Lord, I'm saying, if I spoke with a still, small voice, you could hear it because you're in tune. That if, I, if, I'm, if we're walking together, we're moving together, and I all of a sudden veer off in this direction, it won't take you, you know, months or years to get back where you are with the Lord, where you were meant to be. Um, we use that example of Abraham a lot. And we're in, in the study of Abraham, of going down into Egypt because of the famine. And I just used it recently. And then, you know, when he, when he came to himself, as it were, like the prodigal son, uh, Abraham turned to the place of the altar. He came back to the last place that he really knew he was with the Lord. You know, this is this was it. When's the last time you really heard from the Lord? Right here. When was the last time you felt like you were flowing with the fullness of God? Right here. Well, I'm sure we've got people in this church right now that are not, not feeling like they're flowing with the Lord in the fullness, that are feeling outside or we have that all the time. There's always people that feel like, well, I don't, I don't feel like I belong, or I feel like everybody's more spiritual. I feel like, why are you looking at any of that? Why is that important? Jesus is here. 
And you can get as much Jesus as you want, or as, or as little. I, now, no, I'm not aware of any problems going on with people. I'm not speaking to anybody else because I'm, in, I'm sheltered in place. I don't talk to people on the phone. I don't, you know, visit people and go, oh my God, I, I have no information. So if the shoe fits, it's from the Lord. It's not from me. All right. So, and I'm, I'm just trying to keep people from getting bit, you know, from getting poison in them. <clears throat> and um, so I love this last line here. And, and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. All right. This is so human nature here. This is so human nature, you know. We don't like this. We did this and that. This is wrong. This and that. There should be more. I don't know. See, I don't even know where to go with any of that. But as soon as the problem start happening, where it's the, the not the problem, the the reaping what you sowed starts happening. We want to go back and go off. Oh, okay, I've sinned, you know. I've sinned. Do you recognize what you did? I mean, um, you know, um, I've had people, and, and I don't know why we're on this subject. I really don't. This was not my intention, but I've, I sense the Holy Spirit. But I know people that have, you know, done stuff or didn't. I don't know what they did or whatever, but they'll come back to me sometimes years later and they'll say, Randy, I just asked you to forgive me. And I'll say, forgive you for what? In some cases, I do know what they did. And a lot of times it's because this is us. This is human nature. I'm sure I've done it too. It, it is, we, we take some little thing here and we truly miss the thing that we should be repentant of. That's what you have here in this story. They don't know. They don't see the thing that they should be repentant of. They just see that well, whatever we did, it caused this, and I'm sorry. And they're pointing to the snakes. You know, I'm sorry. Would you do something here? You know, the Lord. Here's the deal. The Father really wants His Son to stray from His Son. Is to stray into poisonous snake land all by itself. God doesn't, in a certain sense, have to send any serpents. He probably had to send them because this is where the cloud and this is where the presence of God is and this is where the, you know, the glory of God resides and there weren't any serpents in that area before this. So God had to send them because the presence of the Lord was there. There wasn't, a, you know, a bunch of evil stuff going on inside there. So he has to bring them in and say, well, you brought them in. I didn't even. I, forgive me. I really didn't want to go to all these places. This isn't, this is not what I had in mind. Um, And they said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. All right, let's talk about that. Hopefully this will get us off this other stuff. Um, they, they say, pray for us. All right. So what if in their mind, 
their idea was this. Moses, you're a man of God. You talk to God face to face. Would you pray and ask him to take the serpents away? That's, that's nominal Christian thinking right there. Just pray and take it away. Moses goes, oh, Lord, take away the serpents. And the Lord goes, no. You know, he didn't say no, and he didn't pray that. He prayed, and the Lord's answer wasn't, okay, I'll take them away, because you asked me to, or because they repented. There's something greater that he wants us to see. There's something more eternal. We can go through our lives down on this planet and just be so carnal and miss the heart of God and miss what the, the eternal thing is when it's right there in the midst of us, you know, right over there in the tabernacle, God's right inside there, you know, kind of thing. And, um, and that's, you know, they had their attitude here, but then what's partially what's wrong is their idea of prayer is just well this is what you're for god this is why you're god and we're just regular people you had the power to take things away well jesus came and he you know he while he healed people and he did this and that you know, he knew that many of those people would end up getting sick or, or dying. I mean, he could heal Lazarus, bring him back from the dead, and he was going to die again, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, there's, the Father wants something greater, and, it, and so that greater is being set forth here. Um, take, away, take away the serpents from us. Take away, that's, that's their thing. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, make you, make you a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. It was made of brass. We know that from several other scriptures in different places. And, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Okay, so... He didn't take the serpents away. He didn't, he didn't heal them or bless them or in that sense. He did not take the serpents away. You have to realize that. He didn't do that. You know, they're going, and you know in their mind, they're saying, oh Lord, take the serpents away. You know, um, he, the wording here is take away the serpents from us. That's the exact wording here in the King James. Take away the serpents. Take away the serpents. Clear a good old path for us to be okay. But he doesn't do it. He leaves the poisonous <laughs> serpents among them. <laughs> you know, and he says, okay, here's the deal. Moses has made a serpent, just like these, but it's made of brass, which refers to judgment. Brass always refers to judgment in the Old Testament. And he puts it on this pole. He holds it up, and everyone that's been bitten by the poison, the poison is going to kill them, is basically the idea. The poison you have in you is going to kill you. Anybody getting this? <laughs> The poison that is in you is going to kill you. And so he, he says, but anyone who looks at this serpent on the pole shall live. Shall live. Not just be healed. You're going to, you're going to live. All right. So... Uh, the rest of that verse, verse 9, is, And Moses made a serpent of brass, and he put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. There's the, there's the word brass. Okay, 
Well, you know, surely you know this. I mean, this is, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But this story is related in one of the most common, most known scriptures in the whole Bible and is related to Jesus' crucifixion and death, which would be where? That's right, John 3.16. Good job. Good job. So let's turn there. Uh, now, you didn't get it there over in the corner. But anyway, John 3.16. Um, but we're going to start actually at John uh, 3.12, and then we're going to work our way down to 16. First, I'll just read it. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? things. All right. Well, right there, we should have just stopped him and said, wait a minute, hold it. You're going to tell us heavenly things. We need to, we're probably not in a good place to even hear it, even catch it. Jesus, talk to us a little more, give us a little more prep. We really want to be in tune with you. You know, the disciples didn't do that much. They usually said, oh, now we understand, yeah, and stuff like that when Jesus said, yeah, I'm sure you do. Um, verse uh, 13, if, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, all right? So he's talking about the one that is in relationship, not just with heavenly things while on the earth, but is in relationship to both heaven and earth. What's this sound like? Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder. Ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus uses that, that example too. <clears throat> um, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up all right okay if you go back if you could just literally shoot back thousands of years to that moment back then with moses and keep in mind what you had heard from the mouth of jesus as you stood there with all the fear and all of the you know people freaking out because of these poisonous serpents everywhere and 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 God telling Moses just put a put a serpent like these guys on a pole and lift it up and if you see it if you look at it you'll you'll live but but Jesus is saying he's that serpent he is that serpent on the pole? Well, I remember, some of you have heard this before many moons ago, but I remember in my early days when I read that, uh, after having read the story over in Numbers, um, that um, it was, I was going, God, why would you put your, why would you put your son as representative of one of these serpents that is biting everybody. Is this, I know that that's not what you're like. I know that you didn't come here just to bite everybody and just kill everybody off. Well, again, those serpents are really the result of our stuff, not God's stuff. We forget that. So I just couldn't, I couldn't get it, you know, and I remember this. I remember saying that there should be a lamb on that pole. Don't put a serpent, don't put an ugly serpent, don't put a scary, poisonous serpent on that pole. And, you know, it's, it's always my questions that the Lord this can come back and, you know, and say, okay, well, I'll tell you why it's a serpent. Because Jesus, he who knew no sin, was made to be sin, that he, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's a little bit of a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians uh, 5.15. I'm sorry, not as sharp as I used to be. Anyway, um, um, the, uh, the realization 
that that serpent represents that he took on not, he didn't just heal these people. He took on all of the poisonous of the people and of the serpents and he took it on himself and that pole represents the cross because the rest of these verses confirm that. That that's what this is. That's what this represents. And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh my God, people, what are we getting out of that? We say, well, okay, if we just look at, the, at Jesus like a picture of him on the cross, or if we just kind of, you know, look at him dying for my sins, um, then I'll have life. Because he said, we shall live. And, and it was always meant to represent something more than you get your whole life back. You know, I'm a, I'm a wretched Israelite in the midst of the wilderness, and I was grumbling along with everybody else. I get bit by a serpent, and I go, oh, God, take away the poison. Give me my life back, my old wretched, grumbling, ugly existence back. You think that's what he wants to give back? No. He wants to give you uh, the one who knew no sin but became sin. The one who looks like a serpent. The one who died as a serpent. That self-giving life. He wants that in you. That's what he's at. That's what he's after. That's what he cares about. That son, the crucified, you know, and when we say the crucified, we go, yeah, the one who died for me. No, that spirit is supposed to be the new life. The new mind. The new heart. The new being. So that we, we don't just look at Jesus, you know, with, you know, nail scarred hands and say, look, I'm, and we go, oh, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. No. Horrible Jesus in serpent form that, that, you know, as you, as you look around you and you see all these serpents, he doesn't take you out of the serpents. He doesn't leave you as you are, not the way John 3.16 is talking about. He wants to bring you into what? The firstborn. Next verse, that, or 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God in this manner, and that's what the word so means. It doesn't mean that God so loves you. I so love you. My God, I, I gave my son, man. I just, I, I just love you so much. No. God, for God in this manner loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Only begotten? Well, that makes him the firstborn. If he's the firstborn and there's none after him, he's still the firstborn. And there will be, because he's the firstborn among many brethren now. Okay? That's Scripture. That's the Word of God. That's God's Word. That's not just Scripture. That's God's Word. That this firstborn, this one, this firstborn, went into death. He went into the plague and he didn't, he didn't kill all the serpents. He didn't rebuke them and make them leave. He took them all into himself. And he went up on that cross and he died so that the serpent that's in you and the poison that's in me and the, and the venom that we spread, that all of that could be done right there. And we could look and say, that's the end of it. That's the end of it right there. And I want that in me, so it'll be the end of it right here. Right here. I mean, you know, I was thinking about this 
this this plague this plague that we've got going on the coronavirus and I was thinking about these two examples actually uh, the first one of the, the Moabite king offering his son as a burnt offering, his firstborn son. And then God, in this situation with the plague of serpents, offering his son as the firstborn to stop the plague. And, you know... Uh, it, it all the examples that we've been giving. I mean, it stopped the plague in the prodigal son. It, it uh, um, in in uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, Abel Cain was the supposed to be the firstborn son, but he was nothing like that, and he's a murderer. And Abel gives himself and gives himself so that the other son will come forth and. Um, and that son's going to be the resurrection portion of the giving of, of Abel. We've been through, we've been through all that. It is clearly says that, and that, that, that Mary, I mean, Mary, that Eve says this, this new one is in his stead. It is the resurrection of Abel. All right. So, because Abel gave himself, because there is a resurrection, because there is resurrection life, because that's what John 3.16 is talking about. And, you know, I thought about these situations, and I thought, I mean, I was watching the news, and I thought, you know, all these people are suffering, people are, can't pay their bills, people are, don't have enough food. I mean, they showed a picture of Dallas, and the line was just in cars, just massively around people trying to get food and you know this plague and you know and I and you know whether this counts or not I don't know but I said in my heart father if the firstborn son is in me and you want me to get this virus so that I take the poison in me but not me because it's Christ remember it's Christ in us it's Christ and as, as take the firstborn who takes that in me, I would be willing to go into death. But isn't that what we all should think and be aware of because Jesus is that way? That's not our mind. That's not my mind. My mind is self-preservation. My mind is avoid the situations where I don't get the... But his mind is get it. Stop the plague. Go, go lay down your life. Well, now, let me say this. I am not recommending that you go out and do stupid things and get the virus thinking because you have Jesus in you that that's the firstborn and that's going to stop the plague. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe it on that front. But I believe that the life of Christ can be so in you and should be so in you to a degree that you are ready to step up at any time, whether, whether you're ready in a year or 10 years or 15 years or, you know, I, I'm not going to be around all that long, that, that you should be ready in your heart to show forth. You know, uh, I, I like the... I like the uh, Communion, we take communion, you know, well, that re that's supposed to represent the lamb in his death, and that was done on Passover. And, and uh, it says, uh, uh, for as oft as you drink this cup and as oft as you eat this bread, you do uh, that you are to show forth his death till he come. My thought was to say to anyone, has, has he come yet? Has he come? I mean, really? No, he hasn't come. Yes, he's in us, but he hasn't come in the clouds or anything yet. So what do we do? We show forth his death. That's our job. That's the command. That's what's been left with us. That we, this is what we're supposed to be doing is showing forth that serpent on a pole. I mean, you know, again, you know, Jesus we, if we looked at that and we didn't, hadn't been bit and we hadn't been told anything about it, we would go, well, that person's an evil person. He's just a serpent. 
He's poison. He's full of poison. He's bad. I think we're talking about 1 Peter now, but let's not jump <laughs> tracks here too much. But to look, but to look and to see it, to see him, to see and to understand what we see. Oh my God, this wasn't a miracle here in Numbers, the book of Numbers. This wasn't a, a miracle. There was no miracle. We would say, well, the miracle is they looked and they were healed. That's not, no, no, that's, that's not a miracle on that front. See, the kind of miracle we're wanting is what they said right here, take away the serpents from us. Just, I want the serpents gone. I don't want you to deal with me. I don't want you to start treading on my ground in here and, you know, upsetting the apple cart that is me. Uh, just take the serpents away. And he says, no, I'm not in to just doing healings or taking serpents away. I do it to show my son. And in this case, I didn't take the serpents away. I showed my son, the, the crucified, the one who was willing to, instead of chase off the snakes, say, all of you come and bite me. That's a completely different Jesus than what most people think. Their relationship with him is clearly God of power. I need your help. You're the guy with all the power. Do this, do that, fix this, you know, make my life better, make my life sweeter. Um, I don't like the way that we're going, you know. All of that, and uh, and we miss we miss the one on the tree. We just all we get the benefit. Oh, I was bit by a snake and now I'm okay. Yeah, and then go off and leave instead of instead of look at looking and say, I want to see deeper, Holy Spirit. Show me deeper. Show me deeper the 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 horror of that, and yet. I, we all see the benefit, but the beauty of it, the beauty of it, the beauty of it. Show me the beauty, but don't just show me the beauty. Don't do it, Father. Make that beauty appear in me to your glory. That beauty. Make that appear in me to your glory and let me understand it and let me walk with you in it and let us be one in this and instead of uh, uh, outsiders that they're all getting the benefits. I mean, you know, I know that some people, there will always be outsiders and they always just want the benefits, you know, <clears throat> and they get by a, a, a bit by a serpent in some circumstance and the Lord heals them because that's all they ever pray. Um, and they continue their half-hearted, lukewarm, fence-riding life, never knowing that it's half-hearted, lukewarm, fence-riding. Uh, they never know it, you know. Uh, I read a script scripture yesterday, I think it was, in uh, Proverbs 27, I think, and it says, open rebuke is better than secret love. You know, Lord, rebuke me. Lord, Lord, come to me and begin to tear down so that you can rebuild in your image. To tear down all that I have built that I think is so holy. This, this, this holy temple. Because in a sense, you know, in a sense, we're all building the temple of God so that he can have a habitation. So, this, so we're going, oh, this, this holy temple that is me, you know, because we're viewing everything through comparing ourselves. Well, I'm better than so-and-so, so I'm doing pretty good, you know. Um, or, 
or in light of not being able to really see what is an offense to him, you know, thou savorest the things that be of man and not the things that be of God. Not, not even able to really discern too much of that and, and to go, I, dang it, I got to have you, Lord, and I've got to have you in a real way, and I got to have you to, that where you, where the, when the enemy comes in like a flood externally, I don't go take it away, but when the enemy comes like a flood in me, I say, let the Spirit of God build a standard against it so that Christ comes forth, so the firstborn is seen so that you get the son that you want your only begotten son that is now the firstborn among all of us and 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 then that that thought lord tear down this temple and lord if you can do it in three days rebuild it <laughs> tear down this temple that i have built for you that is wrong in so many ways i still have you inside but he's i've got you locked up in a holy of holies dark room that doesn't get visited very often i'm the old testament temple instead of the fulfillment of what it should be you know well i don't want to get too close i don't want to go in there too close because he's liable to kill me <laughs> You know, he's liable to show up my stuff so we stay out of the Holy of Holies that we've built for him to keep him in there and then just say, okay, reach your hand out through the veil and heal my arm. I'm having a hard time with it. Or reach your hand through the veil and, you know, let me be slain in the spirit or whatever. I, I probably should quit. But, but, these two examples came so strong to me and so real that what if, I mean, it was so real to me, what if a person could be so right with you, Father, and with your Son that we, that we say, is it possible? That by your son and by that life, we could look like a serpent on a pole because we got their virus and died, but we did it in a right spirit and we did it to your glory and we did it to your honor. And we did it by him, by the one that saved us, but now we're understanding he's more than a savior from serpents. And that it could rise as incense and you smell it and you go okay you know that's it we're gonna we're gonna clear the air again we're gonna go back to default again and man will I'm sure will do his thing again but for this time we will reset in a real way I don't know I'm sure you know, I have been told many times by people, you know, you just, you know, for you, it's just all about Jesus. I mean, we got lives, we got problems, we got this and that. And, and it appears that I don't care or I, you know, or I'm just too hard. I don't believe that's the case. I care deeply. But I think that we need to care about the Father's heart. We need to care more about His heart. We need to love that serpent on a pole and say, I'd give anything to be made in that image instead of, you know. I mean, I, I just maybe want to just close with that thought. Lord, tear down this temple that we have built and rebuilt it in your, rebuild it in your image. Wouldn't that be glory? Wouldn't it be wonderful where he wouldn't be locked away and just referred to every once in a while, but he strolled the courts. He strolled the outer courts and he strolled all of the courts. It was his home, not a, not a religious edifice.
was his home. We were his home, this body, temple of the Lord. In that sweet way that he could, he could just say, you know, move us into any area he wants to. With, and there wouldn't be a big resistance of, Lord, I'm, we're, we're discouraged by reason of the way. You keep, you know, you keep leading us toward a cross. Father, we just ask you to allow the Holy Spirit, if, we're, if we need this, and I don't believe you would have had me really om, almost get off on this, it wasn't on your heart. Father, it is never my intention to discourage our people, but to encourage. But we can see these things as discouragement. The, we, can, we can see the serpents as discouragement instead of running to the serpent that's on the pole and seeing Jesus the way he is. Oh, that would remove the discouragement. But we would have to change our focus. We'd have to change the way we think about ourselves and how important we are compared to how important it is the Father get the one you put inside of us, the firstborn. So, Father, we, we cry out those that are hungry cry out. Those that not are there yet cry out. We cry out and we say, if this is real, if this really is what you want, if this really is the thing that is in your heart, then this one prayer will not be the end of it. We will continue to cry out. And that you will show us, you'll show us how important that serpent on the pole is more important than all the madness going on in the earth with the serpents biting everybody. More important, more important. And that your hands are not trying to reach down in our serpent-filled world and make it better. You're trying to reveal the true nature of your firstborn. And you want him ultimately revealed in us as we live as the temple of that, that serpent on a pole that is really your precious son. Father, we ask these things and more words that we can't call up, but heart desires. We ask these things and more in Jesus' name. Amen.